Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Entry Point Hunting Podcast. I am your host, Justina Lee Stoltz, and I am excited today to have a very special guest on the podcast. Our guest today is Kate Nelson, who is a wildlife health biologist with the BC Wildlife Health Program. Kate is based in Nanaimo on Vancouver Island, and she has worked with the BC Wildlife Health Group since 2006 and has led the BC Chronic Wasting Program for the past 12 years. Her work with CWD includes overseeing surveillance for the disease in BC, coordinating the regional and provincial working groups, connecting with academia and other researchers to stay informed on new science, working with other jurisdictions to learn about management strategies, and sharing that information with partners and stakeholders. Kate is dedicated to building a collaborative team of informed and engaged partners for the best chance of protecting BC wildlife from CWD and other health issues. So without further ado, welcome to Kate. Hello. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on today. Um, I Before we jump into CWD and that entire topic, uh, I'd love for the audience to understand a bit more about who you are and how you came to be in this position uh, and, and so involved in conservation and wildlife and all that kind of stuff. So maybe give us a bit of background on you and your story. Sure. Yeah, it's... Um... Yeah, I, I, maybe it wasn't the traditional path to get into wildlife work, but um, uh, I grew up on the coast of BC and uh, um, my parents were biologists and so I was always sort of connected to nature and and all that. And so went to school, studied biology, knew I wanted to be a biologist since I was six years old. Um, but uh, that's sort of pretty young. A, How did you know that? I didn't even know well, like that biology yeah. was a thing when I was six. <laughs> well, having parents as biologists, my, uh. my parents are marine biologists, and so we were always just kind of drawn mm -hmm. to that, and uh, um, lots of exposure to to science and stuff as a kid. So, Neat. Um, yeah, so so that was kind of nice to to have that life goal, I guess, early on. Um, yeah, so I studied. I studied marine biology and marine ecology in university, actually, and um, didn't really know where that was going to take me. But um, yeah, so kind of did a, a bit of a flip when I graduated. I was lucky enough to um, get a job in Victoria, um, and I met the provincial wildlife veterinarian at that time, Helen Smancha, and she invited me to come and work with her um, for a few months. It was just sort of an entry level position you know, entering data and that sort of thing. And I had never been exposed to that world. I didn't know what a wildlife veterinarian did and, you know, what yeah, that, I also you know. I didn't know that that was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. And so um, it was completely different from what I had been training for, but uh, it was still very interesting. And I said, you know, I was like, well, as long as I'm learning and have this opportunity to learn from this um, from this great human being, then let's try it. Let's do it. And, yeah, um, might as well. yeah, so I, yeah, I stuck around and, you know, she took me on some trips and, you know, taught me how to, um, you know, do necropsies and sample wildlife, dead wildlife. And, and, uh, I was just, my, I, my mind was blown. I was just like, I didn't even know that this whole world existed. And so, you know, I always said, as long as I'm learning and I'm interested, I'll, I'll, I'll keep at it. And mm -hmm. here we are almost 17, almost 18 years later, wow. I'm still working with the wildlife health group. So, um, yeah, it was just sort of the universe kind of put us together and, and, um, I was really inspired by the work. So, so cool. yeah. Yeah. So still, is the, is here. the majority of your job looking for non alive wildlife and doing what did you say? The word is necropsies. Necropsies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, it's like a, um, <laughs> It's like, you know, everyone would be familiar with the word autopsy. So that's mm -hmm. sort of for humans. So necropsy is the, you know, the, the term when you're sampling a, a dead animal, doing a postmortem on a dead animal and collecting samples. And so, yeah, a lot, a lot of the work that we do in wildlife health is um, sort of what we call, we call pathology, sort of looking at, um, you know, accessing these animals, whether people find... Um, you know, dead animals on the landscape and we're trying to understand what's going on mm. or we have targeted surveillance like the CWD program or, or um, you know, other programs like that. Um, you know, just trying to learn as much as we can from the samples that we can access. So yeah. uh, a lot of it's just sort of what we call passive surveillance and reports from the public. And, 
with CWD, like, you know, actually engaging with, with communities and groups like hunting community and um, to access those samples for, for those priority diseases that we're, we're looking for. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in our group, we, you know, we do, um, we do work with live animals sometimes as well and support all of the, the wildlife capture programs in BC and take a, you know, standardized sample, you know, samples from these animals so we can look at population health and, and different mm-hmm. things like that. So yeah, a little bit of everything. Um, the, our program, the wildlife health program spans the the province. So lots of different um, wildlife health uh, initiatives and, and research projects and, you know, supporting, like I said, supporting the broader wildlife program. And um, is, is the stuff that you work on, is that strictly related to, to ungulate populations and deer and CWD, or are you involved in a whole array of these things? Yeah, my main responsibility has been uh, chronic wasting disease for the last number of years. Um, Yeah, we all support each other, but we've kind of need to divide and conquer a little bit. And so the different members of my team are kind of have focus, um, focus areas, right? So, so uh, one of the biologists has been really focused on the avian health and the um, Mm -hmm. avian influenza outbreak. And then, you know, another um, biologist um, focusing on uh, you know, supporting the the regional wildlife programs and the capture mm-hmm. work. There's also, you know, big initiatives around bat health and yeah, um, yeah. Know, we whiteness. actually just had um, uh, Paula Rodriguez de la Vega on last week, and mm-hmm. she was talking all about bats and bat, bat yeah. health and all that kind of white stuff. white nose syndrome and yeah. you know, lots of lots of sheep health work in the province mm-hmm. right now, and so. Um, I get to support some of those initiatives as well, but my main responsibility has been in 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 leading the chronic waste and disease efforts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So maybe that's a, a good point to jump into then there is, is for those, because this is entry point hunting and it's for mm-hmm. um, outdoorsy people, not necessarily just hunters, but outdoorsy mm-hmm. people who are kind of at the beginning of their adventure period and they're not really sure what they know and what they don't know. So yeah. for those that aren't familiar, um, mm-hmm. maybe can you tell us a bit about what is CWD? Who, who does it affect? Um, <laughs> and, and where, where it is in its journey right now, or I guess the backstory of how it got to here. Sure. So chronic wasting disease is a infectious disease um, that affects the species in the deer family. So those are also known as cervids. Mm-hmm. So we know that chronic wasting disease can affect deer, elk, moose, and caribou um, in North America. Uh, the, the, the outbreaks of CWD have mainly been focused in North America. First, first reports in the States in the 1960s in some captive populations. In the 1960s, they didn't know what CWD was. It hadn't been, you know, defined classified. yet yeah. classified yeah but um you know several years later um it was it was described as okay it's it's chronic wasting disease and affecting these species um so it's caused by a an abnormal protein that's a, basically it's a misfolded protein that causes disease um they're also known as prions is another word for them mm-hmm. And uh, what happens is these these prions will uh, accumulate in the body of an infected animal. When they come into contact with um, normal functioning proteins, they can actually convert them into these these disease causing proteins. Mm. And proteins in the body would you know they're meant to they have particular functions and they're meant to sort of break down into component parts and recycle. But these disease causing prions proteins. Uh, they don't break down, they accumulate in the tissue and they, they can be in uh, all tissues like throughout the body, but they, they tend to accumulate in the central nervous system and in the brain ultimately. Mm -hmm. And so as these prions are accumulating in the brain and, and not functioning properly, it causes damage to the brain tissue. And so you, it leads to a neurological disease Mm. that is fatal in every, in every case. So hey, can I um, for one second, are mm-hmm. you able to adjust your mic a little bit? It's just getting a little bit of um, like, I don't know, feedback when you're talking a little bit. Oh, is this better up or down? I don't know how to. 
Yeah, no, that, that seems okay. I wonder if it was just maybe your hair or something was bumping okay. it while you were talking. Oh, okay. That's Earrings? Okay. Maybe, maybe. Who knows? Okay. <laughs> there was just okay. a little bit of like gurgling underneath okay. it. Okay, okay. Um, um, well, it sounds like this is kind of similar to uh, like a cancer virus almost. It is, is that as similar like to a human analogy or, or when you say disease, I might immediately think, mm. is it a virus? Is it a bacteria? Yeah. Um, can it be classified that way or no? Yeah, no, it's uh, unlike other, you know, disease causing agents that we are more familiar with, like bacteria or viruses. This is unique because it's caused by a protein. Mm. And so um, the body actually doesn't recognize these disease causing proteins as anything um, that's not, you know, foreign or it's not supposed right. to be there. And so there's no, there's, there's no um, immune response mm. to them, which is, which is really uh, interesting. Um, Even yeah, once the degradation starts to happen, the body doesn't kick in and yeah. go, oh, we're feeling no, unwell or anything. Nothing. They don't, okay. they don't recognize, the body doesn't recognize it as, as something like that. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's really tricky. So these, you know, people might be familiar with some other prion diseases uh, like mad cow disease or, mm -hmm. you know, a bovine spongiform encephalopathy, BSC. That would mm -hmm. be a prion disease that affects cattle. Um, there's other prion diseases like uh, scrapie that affects sheep and goats. There's mm -hmm. even human forms of prion diseases, uh, one being Creutzfeldt Jakob disease. And so, um, what sort of classifies these diseases as, you know, in, in a in a group of diseases or family of diseases is they're all called uh, transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. And I say that five times fast. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, basically, transmissible just means it's transmissible between the animals. Spongiform actually describes the effect to the brain tissue. So when this, there's cell death, and damage in the brain, um, you actually get like a sponge-like appearance in that brain tissue. So mm. they call it spongiform and then encephalopathy just means of the brain. And so there's this group of prion diseases. They all have their unique set of characteristics and, and you know, that they're, they're dissimilar in a lot of ways, but all similar in that they're caused by this abnormal prion. Mm. Um, and with the different prion diseases too, um, you know, they tend to, to stick to their species groups. You know, there's not, um, generally there's not crossover there. There's generally not crossover, How you know, mm -hmm. however, with BSE, um, you know, we found out that that can actually be transferred to people. If you consume, consume, that infected. was the mad cow one. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mad cow. If you consume infected meat with chronic wasting disease, um, we don't really know if it can transfer to people. There's no direct evidence so far that it can transmit to people, and there's never been a, a case documented in humans. But um, but, but there's still but a lot. There we has don't know been what... there has been some like not consistent, but there has been some research that uh, has transferred in monkeys. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So so the you know public health authorities, you know, coming from the World Health Organization, Health Canada, you know, all of our local public health um, authorities, because we can't rule it out completely, the risk is likely low that, it, that CWD can transmit to people. Mm -hmm. But there's still a lot we don't know about these diseases, and we can't rule it out completely. So they ad strongly advise a precautionary approach. Um, and so any animal that is known to be infected or suspected to be infected with CWD, the, the recommendation is that that is not eaten. And mm -hmm. so they, 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 they want to, um, you know, limit human exposure as much as possible. And um, can you they, tell, like, if you were to harvest as a hunter, if you were to harvest uh, a deer uh, or any other server that has CWD, mm -hmm. um, could you tell just by looking at the meat or is that test, test confirmation only? Yeah, unfortunately, and this is a, a tricky part of this disease is, is generally no, there's no way to tell visually, especially mm -hmm. in a hunter harvested animal, because, um, you know, in fact, most of the, the 
positive cases that are coming out of other places like Alberta and Saskatchewan are in healthy looking hunter harvested animals. Mm. And so, um, and, and, and I'll, I can talk about that a little bit because this is actually really important, um, important part of of this disease and why it's challenging to manage is uh that yeah most animals that are infected um they don't show uh outward symptoms until a very late stage of the disease okay and so um and we we tend not to see sick animals on the landscape with this disease um for whatever reason and you know there's some theories around that but uh at that very late stage of the disease you know, there's the symptoms are described as excessive weight loss, like very thin animals, and then these neurological sort of symptoms, right? Mm -hmm. So poor coordination, drooling, stumbling. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, we don't tend to see those, those um, symptoms on the landscape, uh, probably because you know, predators on the landscape recognize that there's some vulnerability in these animals before people would notice and they probably take them out. And so we don't really, it's quite rare to see animals on the landscape Mm -hmm. um, exhibiting these symptoms. But if anyone ever did observe an animal exhibiting these symptoms, we definitely like to know about it. Yeah, we're drunken Um, deer walking down the road. Yeah, exactly. exactly. But there's some more subtle changes that happen before that late stage. that can make the animal more vulnerable to like being hit by a car maybe, or, um, you know, as they start to have that neurological impact, Mm -hmm. even before there's really obvious symptoms, the animal's behavior might change. So they, they might be less afraid um, of Mm -hmm. people or, or, you know, dogs approaching. And so they may not scurry off like they normally would Um, might (laughs) make them more, yeah, <laughs> hard to tell here. I mean, we've got so many city deer here in the Okanagan yeah. that I mean, you can right. walk up to a deer in any part True. of the yard, and, and here that's and another. Of course, they'll, they'll almost charge you rather than run away from <laughs> no, you. No, exactly right. And there's some other reasons for causing that kind of behavioral um, conditioning, but uh, but yeah, it also makes them in some cases less uh, or more vulnerable to being hit by cars because mm-hmm. they don't they don't you know they're just not not moving as as sharply as they normally would yeah um and so you know there there are some things like that but typically when a hunter is is looking for an animal to harvest it's uh you know they're going for healthy looking animals and so there's Mm -hmm. no there's no real way to 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 tell just by looking and so that's why we request um and encourage hunters to turn in samples so that we can test for these because the the fact that the you know, there could be sick animals on the landscape not showing any symptoms is is challenging because there's no signal to, you know, to us Mm -hmm. to see, you know, to to indicate that there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. And so we have to test a lot of animals to be able to find, you know, to, to detect these cases. And, and with those, so a couple of questions that come to mind out of that with, um, Infected animals that are being eaten, just to confirm, you said that there's, as far as we know, there's not transmission to, so like say a pack of coyotes eats a a deer with CWD, those coyotes are not now carrying CWD because it doesn't seem to cross um, species. That's right. They they could yeah. they could spread it around the landscape because um, there's research that's shown that the those coyotes that eat an infected carcass, they'll ingest the disease causing prions. They won't become infected themselves, but the prions will pass through their digestive system and come out the other end still infectious. So they can spread wow. those on the landscape. So um, so there isn't this this is gonna be one of the other questions I had. There is no way to get rid of that like there's no antidote and there's no way to get rid of them. I thought maybe by going through the digestion of another animal that the prions would, you know, the stomach acids or whatever would no, but that's not the case. No, there's, um, yeah, that's the other, uh, quite tricky thing about this. There's no treatment or vaccine or anything for Mm. chronic wasting disease there, you know, there, people are working on it. There's lots of research trying to, um, develop something along those lines, but I don't think we're, very close to something like that, especially not for free ranging populations. Um, The other tricky thing about this disease is these infected animals have the potential to shed the disease agent into the environment. 
And so um, how it's how it's uh, transmitted between animals is uh, an infected animal will shed the prion, the disease causing prion through their saliva or other bodily fluids. Um, can also shed it into the environment, like a carcass decomposing on the landscape mm -hmm. can get it into the environment. And so animals can transfer the disease through direct contact, nose to nose contact, but there's also this potential to contaminate environments mm. with these prions. And then other animals passing through can ingest the prions off the landscape through, they can be on the surface of plants or in water or in the soil. And so they, they can, um, the disease can transfer indirectly through the environment. So so you're saying, uh, for example, a old deer with CWD lays down and dies and disintegrates into the grass, and then a new deer the next season walks by and eats some of the grass where that old one had passed away, or a deer pees on the grass and the new one comes and eats the grass, that it mm -hmm. can transfer like that? Yes, it can. Yeah. Wow. And we know, um, we don't know how long these prions can uh, exist. Um, That's what I was, was going to ask. How long are it, yeah. they out there? Yeah, um, we don't really know, but we know that it's several years. There's there, wow. there's been some studies that indicate like over 15 years in the absence of other sick animals. So they can just these prions can just hang out in the soil, which is is wow. pretty freaky, right? And yeah. other animals can pick them up um, through the and, environment. And and there's no way, um, again, another tricky aspect of this disease is these prions are virtually indestructible. Um, there's no way to, uh, to deactivate them like practically. But not through incineration or anything Incineration, like that. incineration is the one thing, but if we're talking about like the, uh, you know, the landscape, um, there's mm -hmm. no burning, like just a backyard fire, but like burning's not going to um, be effective in, in deactivating the prions, any sort of, you know, um, reasonable heat or, or um, disinfectants, like those types of things don't mm -hmm. really have any um, uh, effect on the, on the prion. So the one way that um, is known to be the the most effective way of deactivating prions is through incineration through high mm. high heat and so we're uh, talking extended. either like a, a crematorium or like a an intense wildfire i don't think wildfire would hit it like no? I, I, okay. I think yeah i think the um these industrial grade incinerators are sort of the only wow the only, yeah the only ones um and so that so, makes that really tricky for yeah so that's of, really only effective if somebody says hey i found a yeah. roadkill or i i harvested a deer that is confirmed to have cwd mm -hmm. please incinerate this body <laughs> yeah and that, wow. that's what we've okay. we don't have a ton of capacity for incinerating in the province either right yeah. and so i mean incineration is recommended as as the best option but you know barring that we are left with um you know disposing in in landfills and not just regular disposal at landfills we you know certain landfills will have yeah. um special areas where we're disposing of higher risk material and a deep burial and that that sort of thing um so that's and as we that's really not this, that's really not preventing anything, right? Because no, you know uh, it's there. That's yeah. you're just contaminating that site and hoping that yeah. other animals can't access it, right? So, wow. um, yeah. So, I think it, yeah. Okay. So, two questions out of that. One, what does that mean for <laughs> existing deer populations or or cervid populations? Mm -hmm. And two, um, are there deer that get this disease and are immune to it or that, you know, for whatever genetic reason, they're going to be the survival of the fittest uh, mm -hmm. theory and they are the ones that are left over and can repopulate uh, or procreate yeah. with a, a, an immune <laughs> new generation or something. Yeah. Um, let's tackle your second question first, because that's okay. easier to answer, I think. Um, yeah. Short answer is no. There's oh. no, there's no evidence that, that animals Survive will, this. you know, that they don't develop any sort of resistance or immunity. And there's been some research looking at this in the context of caribou and, you know, caribou conservation, mm -hmm. hoping that caribou somehow, you know, will be, you know, impacted less, but it's, it doesn't seem to be the case. Um, so there's, you know, there's different strains of CWD that we're learning. 
um, that impact animals and, and different species in different ways and sometimes prolong the, the course of the disease or shorten it or they might have more intense symptoms, you know, like there's some variation, but in all cases, the animals will will die from it. So so wow. there, there doesn't seem to be any any resistance. Mm. So what does that mean for um, cervid populations? Um, that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's a good question. So um, mm. it'll, it'll kind of take a step back and look at sort of the history of CWD and the impacts on the landscape and what we've learned over the last 30 years. Mm-hmm. Um, when this disease first started to spread and people started to recognize it as CWD, um, and we sorry, can I, can I pause you there? Yeah. I, you might have said this at the beginning and maybe I, I'm just blanking on it, but is it known where the origin is from? Oh, yeah. I'm not sure if we talked about that. We don't know. Okay. Um, we don't know for sure where it originated. The first cases were back in the 1960s in the States, hmm. in Colorado, Wyoming. Yeah, I remember and, that. Um, and from there, it spread through, again, not under, really understanding the disease or, or how, you know, the the transmission pathways and things like that. It, it spread through captive or farmed um, cervids uh, mm-hmm. as well as deer, like it crossed over the fence in both directions and just continued to spread. It uh, was first introduced to Canada in the 1990s through game farmed elk into Saskatchewan. Mm-hmm. And from there crossed the fence and, and you know moved around through these captive populations to different farms where it has the potential to jump, right? So has been spreading in all of these areas now um, in the wild populations and captive populations for several years and um, has had some really significant impacts. I mean, obviously, like devastating impacts to the captive, you know, the farming industries. Mm -hmm. But on the, you know, free ranging wildlife side, um, yeah, we're definitely seeing impacts in the areas that have had this disease on their landscape the longest. We're starting to see populations decline mm-hmm. um, even before the number of animals on the landscapes decline. We see um, changes to the demographics because animals that become infected, they don't live as long. And so there's a shift in in demographics. Uh, you don't see older animals anymore. You don't see the trophy trophy bucks anymore. In some of these places does it um, impact one gender or over the other in the populations yeah the they when in an early outbreak generally and it's different in every ecosystem like we've seen this play out um differently in different places but in general um early in an, in an outbreak it tends to impact the adult males most mm-hmm. um you know mainly uh and that might be you know driven by just the ecology and how they're interacting with one another um Mm. once once the disease becomes established in a population and it gets into the environment um then you you do see it impacting more females and young animals Um, that's interesting i i would have expected it to show up in females almost more because of the herd like nature and it's spreading Mm -hmm. that way. But I guess it makes sense when you think about it of, of the males are a little bit more wanderers and going further distances on their own. to have that ability to have the chance encounter with an infected deer more readily. Yeah. But you know, like different, like I said, different situations have been different. Um, The, the disease outbreak in Northwest Montana and the Libby area um, was, you know, that outbreak was in a, uh, white-tailed deer mainly urban population and they saw Mm. that in affecting both both sexes so yeah it's it it depends in in alberta in the you know um when that was first introduced it seemed to be mainly in adult male mule deer but Mm. uh but now they're seeing it in in other in other species and and in females as well so Mm -hmm. um so yeah so it um has had some some negative impacts but through this you know, the, the challenges, um, we've learned a lot and there's been a lot of lessons learned, um, not only in sort of what we understand of the disease and how it's transmitted and it's potentially getting into the environment, but also just in, in the management context, like how, how the disease, different management strategies have been applied and what's worked and what hasn't worked. Mm-hmm. And so um, BC is in a um 
is in a good position, I guess, that we have the benefit of learning of, you know, we've, we've held out this long, and we've learned a lot um, from, from watching this play out in other places. And there's a, a huge amount of knowledge now. And, you know, CWD experts now that can, um, that are very generous with their knowledge and supporting mm -hmm. us. And, and we've got, um, you know, cross border networks of CWD programs and where everyone's sharing information. And so we have, you know, there's a, 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 a lot of really valuable um, advice out there that we can, that we can draw on and, and lean on and, and the recommendations um, yeah. from these places. Right. So, so, so that I, puts I, us in a better position. I, I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit there. <laughs> How better of a position can you be in when you have a incurable fatal disease that <laughs> is know. as of this year, I, I believe, right? January, 2024 confirmed yeah. CWD cases found in somewhere in the Kootenays. So it's, That's it's right. in BC now. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, <laughs> I, I want to be so hopeful that all of this <laughs> knowledge and us being the last uh, yeah. to, to kind of get it means mm mean something but like yeah. if there's no well yeah there's no nothing like you're what not, does all that do for us yeah you're not wrong i mean i'm 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 a optimistic person and i'm i'm trying to stay you know hopeful and optimistic mm -hmm. in this um but you're right it's 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 a super challenging disease no matter how you how you cut it um and i i'm just i'm trying to you know, just reflect on the fact that if we had have detected this disease 20 years ago, we'd be in a very different position than we are now. It's still... What, what it's, does that mean? Like, what do you think is different then versus now in the way that our province will respond to it? Yeah. So, so the, the, what we're, what we're learning from other places and the, and the big, one of the biggest sort of pieces of, of advice or or evidence, I guess, is that the earlier you detect this disease, um, the more uh, effective any management is going to be. And so there is now evidence in places in the states um, that have had this disease for several years where they detected the disease early and they've been able to implement management over the, the last 20 years and have effectively kept infection rates low like below three percent of the wildlife population so, so so what would management look like when you say that for uh i guess i have two thoughts on that mm -hmm. or two questions one is what does management look like what what does that actually mean in practicality yeah. and yeah. two do we think that because of the terrain and the geography in bc that our deer might have at least the wild populations might have a, a better chance of um, because they're a little bit more remote or up in high hills or, you know, they're not, they're not all congregated in the city, although there are a lot of city deer. Yeah. Um, do we think our terrain will have any impact in, um, the management process, I guess, as well? Yeah. Yeah. So, so exactly. BC's landscape is so different relative to some of these other places that have a lot of knowledge now and a lot of experience with CWD. Um, you know, we can't, extract the sort of the management and and the um what's happened like in the in the prairies to 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 bc right because it's so mm -hmm. it's such a different ecosystem so we really don't know how it's going to behave here but um but yeah presumably our geography and our like the natural landscape features are, are going to influence how mm -hmm. how this disease is going to to move potentially. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, for sure. So so what does management look like? So we mm -hmm. have, I guess, a, a, a suite of tools in our toolbox and um, the different situations are going to, um, you know, really determine what tools are going to be most effective. But coming back to some examples um, in the state. So the jurisdictions that detected the disease early, um, you know, with very small number of animals affected, were able to apply um, management in the form of harvest. So, so the 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 main recommendation as far as um, 
uh, tools is that hunting is the most important tool that we have in managing CWD. And there are places now that have been able to uh, implement harvest uh, strategies that have been effective in, in slowing it down mm -hmm. and, and keeping the infection rates low. And sometimes, um, you know, harvest management is coupled with um, some targeted removals. Um, but, but really the, what's most important, and I think one of the big lessons learned is, you know, the, the situation that lots of people are familiar with in, in Alberta when it was first detected in the early 2000s, the sort of theory of the day at that time was to hit it hard and to hit it fast and stop it in its tracks. Mm. And, and so, you know, some large scale calls were implemented there and sure it was effective in slowing the disease down, but they were very controversial and very unpopular. And so those programs were, were halted, right? Yeah. Anytime you call, I mean, we just saw that in BC and, and when yeah. my first thought was when you said, you know, uh, hunters are, are, a critical management piece and uh yeah. and some selected harvest and i my immediate thought was well hopefully it's hopefully the government's a little smarter on this avenue than they have been with some other uh you know outsourced culls that they've recently done on on the islands and such yeah so so the you know what we've learned from that was that those types of strategies were not successful they were they were halted and the disease was you know able to just take hold of those populations and what we've seen in alberta is just increasing um you know alberta and saskatchewan is is just increasing disease prevalence over time and continued spread and so that was unfortunate there's some other examples in the states where um you know there wasn't a lot of testing being done and so when they got their first case the you know the response plan went and did some targeted sampling and and the result of that was, you know, 25% of the population was already infected. Mm. And at that point, there's nothing you can do. It's there. You're just going to be monitoring it. So what we've been trying to do in BC, I'm, our, you know, we've been doing surveillance since the early 2000s for this disease in BC, long before we were considered high risk. But there was always a, the chance that it, the disease could be brought in on an infected carcass. And so we had to start developing those programs. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and uh, yeah, through that testing, our goal has always been to detect it as early as possible with the fewest number of animals infected in, in the smallest geographic scale. And so um, that is the key to this. So if you can catch it early, and hopefully we have, um, because we've detected these two cases in an area where we have been doing enhanced surveillance and mandatory testing, and we've tested, you know, thousands of animals from these areas, um, mainly from hunters. And so, you know, just recognizing the important partnership there where this program wouldn't exist without those hunter samples. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, now, now that hopefully that's the situation that we're in, we're still pulling the information together. But hopefully we've caught it early and we can apply some of these tools. Um, and another really key point is understanding the dynamics of the, the disease outbreak. As I've mentioned, it's just, it has been different in different ecosystems. It's really important to know what species are affected and um, the demographics of the, of the population, where those populations are, how they're interacting with adjacent populations, mm -hmm. um, where like we have all of this surveillance data now, thank you to the hunters, where we have animals that have tested negative. And so mm -hmm. we're looking at that information and those where those animals were harvested in relation to these positive cases. And that tells us, gives us a, you know, a, a clearer picture of the scope of this outbreak. So, you know, if we have from a management unit, 300 animals tested and only one came back positive, that's a really good indication that it's it's a small proportion of the population and we've ca caught it early. So we can we can zero in and focus our our efforts and our resources and in targeting a very, you know, specific population units. Um, targeting the animals that are most likely to be infected on the smallest geographic scale possible. And if we can do that, then there's, you know, evidence f from elsewhere that, that that can be really effective. We're not going to eradicate this disease. The disease is, mm -hmm. is now here. I mean, mm -hmm. we, 
that's always a goal. Um, but once it's detected, chances are it's in the environment. Um, it's, you know, there's no way to clean up those environments now. So it's mm -hmm. here. Um, and, and are people, is, is there still research happening to see if there is some sort of solution to this disease or a, a vaccine or a medication or, or something of that nature? Is that research still happening or is it just kind of been given oh, up yeah. on? Yeah. No, absolutely. There's a lot of research trying to develop that, particularly, I think, driven by the captive farming um, mm. industry, you know, mm -hmm. because the application of vaccines and stuff would be a lot more feasible in a captive population. Totally. But yeah. There's all kinds of um, research going on right now to look for vaccines and treatment to look at um, ways uh, to test this disease in live animals, because currently you can only test for the disease in dead animals. That's the that's the the standard um, test. So there's, you know, it, it would be advantageous if we had yeah. uh, better testing, you know, faster testing, all that kind of stuff, ways so, to sample um, environmental, like we don't have any way to test mm -hmm. environmental samples. So there's research trying to advance that as well. So, um, so yeah. if there's no way to test environmental samples, how would they know that the prions are there? It's through through research studies. So they've they've taken these environmental samples. I should say you can't test environmental samples if you you know collect some soil or plants and take them back to a lab, and then they have specialized equipment in the lab. But yeah. in the in the field, we don't have any tests to oh, like, like instantaneous te test the, tests. Test yeah. the, okay. the hay coming across the border, yeah. In, yeah. you know, because because that could move the disease around as well. Yeah, totally. Um, you know, te there's there's no way to test. Um, meat live. you know yeah. uh, or live animals there's no way to test the meat it's we're, we're looking at um specific tissues um mm -hmm. in, in, in the, the head and, yeah. and then you know submitting those to a lab so and and so that brings me to a question that i have um in regards to samples so for those that are hunters that are maybe less aware of the cwd issue or that there is even a program for testing it mm -hmm. um how can people submit um what do people need to submit and how and where can they submit samples uh, for testing? Yeah, so we, um, we, we really encourage uh, hunters to submit any samples from deer, elk, moose, or caribou in anywhere in BC um, because of the possibility of it coming in on, a, on an infected carcass from elsewhere or hay, it really could pop up anywhere. So although our focus right now is in the Kootenai region and responding to that situation, we, we want to be, um, you know, diligent in maintaining surveillance across the province too. So I think that's a really important part point. Mm -hmm. um, we need tissues basically that are at the back of the throat um, or the base of the skull. So traditionally hunters can submit the head of the animal that they've harvested. Um, we don't need the top of the brain. We don't need the ant We don't want the antlers. So there's a few different ways that hunters can submit the sample if they want to retain parts of the, the antler, you know, the skull for, um, for like a, a trophy mounting. Yeah. for mounting. And, um, and so um, hunters can cut the, the skull cap off with the antlers, that's fine. Um, the tissues that we need are a specific lymph node at the back of the throat and tonsils. And so if a hunter wants to just remove the lower jaw, um, by cutting around the, the arch at the back of the low jaw bone, the, the tissues that we need are just tucked inside there. So hunters can actually remove the low jaw maintaining the soft tissue at the back of the throat and just turn that in as a sample and retain the rest of the head. Mm -hmm. um, there's and I'll, also, I'll throw yeah. a link because I think there is a, a an infographic somewhere uh, on the site somewhere. So I'll throw that yeah. link down below in the description when this video is posted Perfect. as well. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, we're also offering training. Uh, you know, we've had several training sessions with hunters that are interested in collecting their own tissues, right? So mm -hmm. if a hunter wants to go in, all you need is a sharp knife and a Ziploc bag and you can pull the the tonsils and the lymph nodes and submit those. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, so and where you, do they submit those to? Okay, so um, we have freezer locations set up across the province for drop off locations. Um, you know, is we don't there have a list of those on the website somewhere. Yes, there is. Yeah, on our CWD website, there's a list, and that's the best uh, sort of reference to look for the freezer locations because we're adding new locations all the time and so check the website um we have sort of the 
the best coverage in southern BC. Of course, lots of freezers in the Kootenai region. We're setting up more in the Okanagan and the, you know, the Thompson region and uh, lower mainland. Um, but yeah, yeah so we're folks, if to- you have a spare and empty freezer that you would like to yeah. be a drop off location, uh, <laughs> so you'll get too. everything yeah. from a sandwich bag to actual head sized yeah. uh, samples. But uh, absolutely, yeah. we're keen to hear, um, you know, if if hunters are hunting in an area or they reside in an area and there isn't a convenient freezer location, you know, please reach out to us because we want to provide that. And we're partnering with with different businesses and and clubs to host these freezers. And so we're, we're hoping to, you know, add more and, and make it as convenient as possible for folks to turn in to turn mm-hmm. in samples. Yeah. 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 Just coming back to the sample, though, I don't want to miss the for the elk and the moose. Um, and caribou, we collect a slightly different tissue on those animals. So still the tonsil, um, or rather not the tonsil, the lymph node at the back of the throat. But then we collect part of the brain stem as well. Mm-hmm. And so for deer, um, sorry, for elk, moose, and caribou, submitting the low jaw is not an option because we need part of that the, the base of the skull. Of the, the skull. Um, so again, if, if hunters want to submit the whole head or check out the YouTube video. We just need a portion of the brain stem that's right at the base of the skull. And so um, hunters can collect that sample themselves and submit that. Perfect. If you want to retain the, the head. Yeah. 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 All that information is is on our website, again, with instructions on, on the different options, just trying to make it as, you know, as easy as possible for hunters to submit those samples because they're so valuable to us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, In the interest of time, we will move a little bit towards wrapping things up here, unless there's anything else absolutely critical that you think people should know about CWD um, before we move into our our closing. Yeah, no, I think um, it's, it's, we're in an interesting time right now. We're still in the early stages of, um, of addressing this response and these first detections in BC. So there's going to be lots of new information coming out over the coming months. And um, yeah, I just encourage folks to just check, check our website for that new information and, um, and reach out to like, we, we always love hearing from people and and getting, uh, you know, input and, and, um, you know, ideas. So, so you can always contact us directly. Amazing. Um, I guess in the larger picture of what you're doing, is there anything that feels um, hopeful or exciting that's on the horizon that you're looking forward to uh, in your work that maybe is a little bit more upbeat than the the impending CWD <laughs> issue? Well, you know, it's funny. Um, this last week since the first detection, lots of people have been like, how are you still smiling so much? <laughs> but I have to say it's, uh, this is not a, a this was, this was a, a sad day for, for us, for, you know, for wildlife in BC to get this detection. But we, um, we knew it was coming, you know, this is not a surprise. We knew it was coming and, and this is an area where we expected it to show up. And so we've been really working really hard to prepare for this day and to, you know, get everything in line so that we can respond to this as effectively as possible. And part of that has been in um, working with a collaborative team and our, we have a provincial advisory team and uh, a couple of working groups that include the, um, you know, the local First Nations, the, uh, all the hunting organizations, trappers um other agency partners and and different experts and um working with that team is has been is really what inspires me right now and and brings me hope because uh we have these um really important relationships and partnerships and even though this is a very challenging time for us i've just been uh i've been overwhelmed with the amount of support and everyone reaching out and and offering um offering their help and everyone's really stepping up and mm-hmm. so this is going to be a this is going to be a, a hard road and it's going to be a long road but i'm really optimistic um and looking forward to working with everybody together on this because mm-hmm. um you know that that's that's what we, we've been preparing for and it's all, it's all coming together so 
um, I, I think I think you're the right person for the job, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> you're the right person. I, you got we, that internal optimism. <laughs> I love it. We, uh, you know, I I think it's gonna it's gonna be tricky for sure. But I think we have done everything that we could to position ourselves to, um, you know, tackle this, um, to, to tackle this issue. And I think it's going to require a team effort, but I look forward to working with that team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I will make sure that I drop the website link down below so people can see uh, the videos and the infographics and all that kind of stuff about how to make your submissions for CWD samples if you have them and if you've harvested um, or if you come across uh, deceased animals in the woods, you're welcome to to call into probably the wrap line uh, mm -hmm. and they'll come and uh, collect those animals and then can make the the proper connections there. Yeah, um, Kate, what would be your two minutes or less piece of advice to somebody that is brand new into the conservation world or the hunting world, just the, the wild, wild wilderness world. What's something <laughs> you wish that you knew at the start of your wilderness conservation journey? Oh, okay. Something that I knew. Um, wish that well, you knew or that somebody <laughs> told wish you. wish that I knew. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I knew nothing when I started. Um, seriously. Uh, coming from you know, the marine biology background and I started and, and everything was, was brand new. Um, but I had really great teachers and, uh, one in particular, I have to give a shout out to Helen, who was the, uh, my, the, um, wildlife veterinarian when I started. Um, but yeah, I think at, at the end of the day, what I've really come to appreciate is, is, you know, as much as I'm a super nerd about the science and the research and the technical stuff and, you know, the, sampling and all the lab work I like I love that obviously but um what I've really come to uh, appreciate um is the importance of of these like relationships and working with the people mm -hmm. and um I think you know they don't really they don't really teach you that in school right it's it's you know they they set you up with all that technical knowledge but then you show up and that was something that really that Helen really instilled in me was um is the relationships that make this work mm -hmm. and um you know the the collaboration and and in these you know in these early days of cwd like it's it's been everything um mm -hmm. to just to see the the passion and the advocacy and like the hunting organizations are are you know exceptional advocates in this work and so just we don't always um you know, we don't always have the same values and we don't always have the same priorities, but we all want healthy wildlife. Mm -hmm. And so we, I think just to come into it with an open mind and um, just, you know, appreciating that, um, you know, we, we can, we, we just, we all have to work together yeah. um, to, to, to maintain healthy wildlife. And so um, I guess that if, if that's something that, you know, it, present Kate could have told <laughs> green Kate yeah. when I first started. I, I mean, I think, I think I figured it out pretty quickly and was really inspired by the people that, that showed up. Um, yeah. But, uh, but Community yeah, is key for sure. Community for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, what is your favorite conservation resource, whether that's a podcast, a book, a forum, where do you go for, for conservation information? Oh, see, I'm a nerd. I love the literature. I go to the, I go to the science The um, that's always been a, a real passion for me throughout my career too, is, is I kind of, I see myself as having a role in, I can dig into the, that science and then, you know, frame it in a way that I can then communicate that to different audiences, mm -hmm. you know, because not everybody wants to read these scientific papers. I do. Nope. Like, I, do. I, I love it. That's why I you're there. It. Yeah. <laughs> but, but there's so much good information. There's so much good knowledge. And I, I do think it's really important to be basing our, our decisions in science. Mm -hmm. And, and so working, you know, to, towards making that information more accessible to people. Yeah. And so totally. that's, yeah. Cool. Um, what is your favorite wilderness snack? Oh, <laughs> Oh wow, this is such a good question. Um, wilderness snacks. Oh, I'm a big fan of like smoked salmon, like salmon mm -hmm. jerky. Yeah, 
something like that, probably, yep. and a beer. And a beer. Nice. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. Um, if you go out for a hike or you're out in the wilderness doing work, are you mm -hmm. uh, a one sock or a double sock kind of person? <laughs> it depends where I am. <laughs> yeah, true. I guess. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm a I'm a coastal girl, so I'm used to getting wet. So just a, mm. a good like wool sock, I think, is is yeah. my go to. Yeah. Um, what's the one absolute essential item that you have to have every time you go out into the woods? Oh wow. Um that's such a good question. Snacks. I guess. Snacks, yeah. <laughs> the snacks reference uh, question yeah. two of them. <laughs> snacks. I know I'm going through the things I'm like, yeah, you know, water's important. The the camera, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, at the end of the day, yeah. snacks, yeah. Totally. Snacks and treats. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I like to do this question uh as a fun new introduction. What's one question that you'd like to ask the next podcast guest? It could be anything you want any random question at all. And I will ask them at the end of their interview. Oh, wow. Oh man. Um, am I going to get this from the previous person? No, no, you're the first <laughs> oh, one. You get to new? start this. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, what would the question be? Um, I guess, okay. I'm, I mean, maybe this is, maybe this is silly, but um, I, I would love to hear, you know, what would, what their advice would be for us, um, wildlife health in like making information more accessible. Is that boring? I just, it's super, super important for me. But, yeah, no, uh, that's, that's good. Yeah. So just for anybody out there, it doesn't matter who they are. If, um, if they haven't heard of wildlife health in BC, then that then that's a problem. And, and what could we do to make that better? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Amazing. You have Thank to you let so me much. know what they say. <laughs> I will. Absolutely. I'll send you the episode. <laughs> um, any last comments and also where can people get in touch with you if they want to? Sure. Um, uh, people can get in touch with us through our website and you're going to provide that link. So I've got yeah. my, my email and my phone number on that website. It's, it's kind of the best go-to resource for new information. And then if you don't find what you're looking for on the website, my phone number and email is right there. So, Perfect. so that's that. And, uh, and yeah, final comment is just thank you to you, um, for inviting me on. Um, it's super important to get this information out. And so I really appreciate the invitation and, and having the opportunity to, to share it on your platform. So thanks. Yeah, thank you so much. It's uh, it's always a treat to have you on. And I learn something new every time we talk about CWD. I'm still awesome. glad that you're doing that job because I don't know if I'd be <laughs> as optimistic, but thank you for coming on today and for sharing so much good information. Great. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in today to watch or listen and make sure to hit that like or subscribe button to follow along wherever you get your podcasts. If you have any questions, comments, or reviews, please drop them down below. I will read them and I will get back to you. Or you can reach me at questions at entrypointhunting.com. If you know an expert or someone who offers great advice or is just growing rapidly in the field of hunting, angling, or conservation, please send them my way. I would love to reach out and connect with them. And until next time, friends, stay hungry. <laughs>